Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Boy, the room looks very different with the tables. I hope that you enjoy them today. I, my name is Joanne Britton, and I want to welcome you to our bucket course this morning. This is the second class in the session presented by Ben Gunther on wind tunnels. Before I turn it over to Ben, though, I want to remind you to turn on your T-coils and please turn off and put away your cell phones for the duration of the class. Thank you. And now let's welcome Ben. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, that's good. Let's... All right. Now we're going to be talking about the 8-foot high-speed tunnel. I always like this picture because you've got a nice, dark, it's black and white, nice dark background. You're on, you get reflections in the back river. And it just reminds me of like either a Nordic or Icelandic uh, fortress or something. It just has that appearance. Part of that reason is because this, this tunnel is made of concrete, which is the first one for an ACA to do like that. Um, Oh, never mind. I think it sounds too high. Too high? It's too loud. Boom, it's too loud. We need to say that. That's a <laughs> Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. You have to talk more. I have to talk more. <laughs> okay. We'll do that next. It was, end of, uh, it was authorized in July of 1933 and became operational in March of 36 at a cost of uh, $266,000. The purpose of the tunnel was to test aircraft models and components approaching the speed of sound. Now, this is back during the Depression, and lucky for them, they were able to get the funding from the WPA, which is the Public Work Administration, under the authority of the National Re Industry Recovery Act. Um, it's a single return, let me uh, advance. It's a single return, it just keeps going around and around. Your engine is actually in a separate building, and your fan blades are here and train veins, offices. This tunnel um, had a wall, that, the wall thickness of this tunnel was between four and six inches, except for one area, which is a test chamber. You had this igloo that surrounded it. And we'll get into why they had to build that in a minute or two. And this is a heat exchanger. When the air is flowing through a tunnel. It interacts with the sides, creating turbulence. But that friction also heats up the air. At lower speeds, that's not a problem. But when you're getting up the speeds this thing was supposed to be running at, the initial max speed was 575 miles an hour. You start building up heat. So they had to find a way to cool the tunnel down. And they basically came up with a system of using a heat exchanger. And what that does is it takes, in this case, it took about 4 to 5 percent of the air and exhausted it, and it drew in the same amount. And that was the cooler air from the outside. Once um, this thing was running, the average temperature ended up being about 150, which they could live with. <coughs> now, as the reason why they needed the little igloo, we have to go to another little science lesson. Hopefully rather short. Uh, Danielle Bernoulli, uh, with a mathematician and physicist. He is family, uh, his family lived in the Netherlands. He was, that's where he was born. Unfortunately, uh, it was in the Spanish occupied section at, the, at that time, and the Spaniards were Catholic, and his family was Protestant. So his dad uh, ended up moving the family to Switzerland, and that's where he grew up. And it's, for all practical purposes, he considered himself a Swiss. But he was a well-known mathematician at the time, and he came up with the Bernoulli principle, although I guess, to be truthful, other people named it after him. Well, it basically states that an increase in the speed of a fluid occurs simultaneously with a decrease in the pressure. And that basically ties into with conservation of energy. If you're going to increase, whoops, if you're going to increase, if you neck this down, you basically increase the volume, increase the velocity. Here's your pressure in the normal size. But when you increase the velocity, the pressure drops. 
With the eight foot high speed tunnel, because it's going so fast, 575 miles an hour in the initial version, the pressure would actually drop in, or, in around that test chamber to about 10,000 feet. And later, when they actually were able to do some mod modifications to the tunnel and actually ran, ran faster, uh, that pressure would actually drop to about 12,000 feet. So they did provide the uh, test section with uh, oxygen masks. This is, uh, it came online on March 36, and this is basically a picture of it. The tunnel, even though, of course, I don't know exactly the dates, but this one isn't exactly complete, but it's because it doesn't have any balances down here, but you do have a control panel, and this is the eight foot diameter circular um, test section. And this is shot in the 45, basically the same area. Let's see that looks see the nice concrete walls in the back, but they do have the Toledo balances. Now they have made an advance by this time, actually it was probably in the mid, mid to late 30s, when they, they don't, and they no longer have any, a lot of engineers that are reading out the, uh, the data for a recorder to write down. He just presses a button, and all these machines have uh, paper printouts, so all the data could be uh, printed out on paper form. And in World War II, the Army Air Corps decided that they were going to camouflage Langley Field. So they decided to paint everything, basically all the wind tunnels, all the shops, uh, anything around the Black Pack River, all of drab. And this cost a nice uh, $500,000 to do that at the time. They also uh, uh, built some phony buildings. This Here's funny. This is the actual uh, office and shop areas. And uh, this building right here, this is our old, old friend, the Propeller Research Tunnel. And here's the uh, eight foot right here, and with the igloo. In 1980, initially, when they were uh, for the tunnel to operate, they had one 8,000 uh, horsepower electric motor. And in 45, they wanted to increase the speed, so they in installed a uh, 16,000 horsepower electric motor. And that got them up to Mach 0.92. And they used that quite a while during the war, but after that, <coughs> they were having, basically, what they were getting is choking problem in the tunnel. Anytime you had a line around the windows or anything like that, at the high Mach numbers, you're generating shock waves. Now, on the lower speed tunnels, if you use the analogy of a, a stream, the center of the stream is nice and generally nice and linear, if it's deep enough, straight, flowing. But when you get to the sides, you'll have uh, turbulence, eddies, things like that. But the center stream is strong enough where those eddies don't generate and go into the main stream. They're just absorbed by it and carried down. But when you get up to about almost 700 miles an hour, which would be about not, not Mach 9.92, you'd be getting shock waves off all the little window frames, any seams in, the, in here, would generate shock waves. And these shock waves were strong enough that they could actually go into the flow. The edges of the tunnel would be like this, and they'd just flow right in the middle. And that would be turbulence, and it would make it very hard to get any good data when you're doing your test. Even if you reduce the size of the, the model, uh, you're still getting a hard problem doing that. In uh, late 40s, uh, John Stack was the head of the uh, high speed division, delegated a, a, a group of men to study this problem. And they eventually came up with a solution of a slotted wind tunnel. You would have the slots, a slot here, another slot here, all the way around. Those would actually end up, sorry, carrying your air up, over, and down, back, behind, especially the turbulence. So that opened up a, an area in the center where they actually could do some uh, good research. 
This was actually the second tunnel that had this slotted wing tunnel. They actually uh, tested it out first on the 60-foot high-speed tunnel, which will be the next tunnel I'll talk about. And that's on, it's coming up. Here's an example of the original tunnel. You'll see a big seam here. You have windows here and here and that more down here. Any, anything that would generate a shockwave would do that, and it would flow towards the center. Now, this is 12-sided um, test chamber. You have slots. They would absorb the propagation of the uh, shockwaves so they wouldn't propagate so much in the center and they actually suck them in. Like I said, move them out and around. Now, one of the researchers who was assigned to this tunnel was a gentleman named Richard Whitcomb. And in the late 50s, he ended up uh, creating what was called a sonic, trisonic uh, area rule, and for which he was uh, awarded the Collier Trophy in 1955. Basically, what that did, this, both of these are um, Convair F-102 fighter planes. This is the original one, the X. This is the second one, the Y. It's not the best picture, but you can see it's a straight fuselage up and down here. It flares out for the inlets. It's a delta wing, so the maximum width is back here. For a long time, forever, I guess we could say, they always knew the fuselage would generate drag, and the wings would generate drag. For whatever reason, they never actually put the two together, so to speak. So what you have is wing drag would actually increase until you hit the maximum here. Well, the fuselage is pretty much straight, so it's going to have the maximum drag here. So you combine all this, it's like a lot of drag right there. When Convair wanted to test this, they uh, created some models, NACA tested models, and they could not get the models to go past Mach 1. And they basically told Convair, you're not going to get the jet to do it either. So Convair didn't believe them. They went ahead and built the prototype. They flew it, and it didn't go past Mach 1. <laughs> what comes this area rule back here, you should be elongated, the inlets, the elongated the nose, greater finesse ratio. Uh, same wings, so you maximum wing drags back here, but they narrowed it down here and here, so the minimum is right about here for drag. Maximum fuselage drag would be around this area, but you have no wing drag, so that, you know, it helps. Um, with this combination, um, it was popular called a, a Coke bottle or foil shade, or fuselage shade. It was easily made Mach 1. In fact, I think the top speed for the plane actually ended up being like Mach 1.2 or 3. Mm -hmm. Let's see. One last. So, let's see. Here we have the 8-foot tunnel. The original office. They also love building offices, so they added on. Here's our friend, full scale tunnel, substation. One thing, you'll, if you look at aerial photos of uh, Langley, whether it's the east side or the west side, they have a lot of substations because the tunnels just eat up electricity like crazy. By right, 1961, they actually de deactivated this eight foot tunnel and they provided the engine and, and the pro uh, propellers to uh, Wright-Patterson, because they were building a, a tunnel out there at the time. And in 2011, which was a bad year for wind tunnels, uh, <laughs> they tore down both of those wind tunnels. And over here you can see the remains of the igloo. And you're looking straight straight to the spin tunnel, because the full-scale tunnel disappeared at that year too. So, a little word before we get into the 16 foot. In December 30, 1938, uh, a special 
Committee on the Future Research Facilities of NASA recommended the creation of another laboratory as well as uh, several new facilities at Langley. And this was chaired by Rear Admiral Arthur Cook. The military was quite concerned, even if it was 38 and later in 39, they could see war was coming. And they realized that as well as Langley did, did that one facility was to be very hard pressed to meet the war needs that was going to be coming. So they highly recommended building at least another facility. In August of 39, Congress authorized construction of a second NEC research station. This one at Navy's Moffett Field in California, which uh, became known as the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory, named after Joseph S. Ames, who was a former president of John Hopkins University and also the chairman of the executive committee for the NACA from 27 to 39. And then in October of 39, a second special committee on the future research facilities of NACA was headed by Charles Lindbergh, and he recommended that a power plant research center be established at once. So in June 1940, Congress authorized construction of the third NASA laboratory near Cleveland, Ohio, which became the Aircraft Engine Research Laboratory. And in 1948, it was named, for, named after George W. Lewis, who was the NEC Director of Aeronautical Research from 1924 to 1947 when he died. And then later, uh, when John Glenn died, since he was a NASA employee and senator from Ohio, they ended up name, naming the uh, Lewis Center after John Glenn. Also, sometime in 1939, it's never really been pinpointed, um, the Air Force decided to be nice and they ended up giving uh, NACA 500 acres of land on the west side of the airfield. And then uh, within less than a year, they ended up getting another 300 acres. So, of course, by 19, uh, by 1940, they had 800 acres, which is literally almost half of the original acreage that the Army Air Service uh, bought in 1917, which I thought was interesting because they were so generous when they initially only gave them 6.8 acres <laughs> in 1920. All right, this is a 16-foot high-speed tunnel. Oh, and as a side, basically when they built Ames, they basically copied a lot of the tunnels that Langley had. They, they built a 16 foot, they built an 8 foot high speed tunnel. The um, next couple of tunnels we'll be talking about are some larger uh, 7 by 10 tunnels. They end up building the same tunnels. And uh, this was a good boom, especially for the aircraft manufacturers, because that's where basically a lot of the uh, aircraft man manufacturers are located nowadays, or back in the 40s, where it's in the West Coast. Initially, Langley was a good location because a lot of the business was up in Connecticut and New York and places like that. So it wasn't too far to get to go down to Langley. Anyway. So, we have two blades, counter-rotating, which takes the rotational twist out. You have a nice big heat exchanger because this is a large tunnel, larger than eight foot and it's going to go almost the same speed range, so it's going to have to dissipate a lot of air. And it actually removed 20% of the air out and would draw in 20% to keep it cool. Again, to keep it down to about uh, 150 degrees. It had one large clamshell door that would open up, allowing a crane up top here to lift up the models and pull, to lace them down in here. And as you can see, this is early drawing, this would be a bit, what it looked like actually when it came online. And it was testing a, a wing, span the whole length of it on the cell and it would have a propeller. Here are your uh, mechanisms to run your uh, balance systems. This is a drawing, or not a drawing, pardon me, a picture of the construction. I included it because it will bear some relevance uh, later on. Just note how far apart spaced these uh, rings are, these stiffening rings. 
and this is in 48. Um, the two favorite colors for uh, wind tunnels were basically either white or silver, mainly to keep the thing cool in the summertime. And I want to talk about this. This is building 1150 on the, now we have the east and west side. So this is all on the west side, the new large land grant from the Air Force, Army Air Corps. On the east side, the original Langley, um, they had an east bottle shop that was used to make wind tunnel blades and models. Well, they needed one over here and they built a really large building. And when I went into service at uh, NASA, this was where I went into. But, uh, they had built a brand new model shop, composite model development section, a different location. And I was, me and the other two apprentices and some of the other lower ranking members, we had a nice job of help moving all the equipment out over to the new facilities. Here is the actual wing, the cell engine, and propeller from the, in this case, it's the prototype of the A26 Vader. It was being tested in December 41. I know, it was a mist, I didn't tell you that. The original cost was 1.7 million. It was authorized in 39 and became operational December 5th, 1941. Uh, initially, it had uh, two counter-rotating fans, and it was powered by two 8,000 horsepower electric motors. So a total of 16,000 horsepower. And the best they could do was uh, about Mach 0.6. This is the Azon, uh, basically a radio control bomb. Uh, if you think high-tech bombs are new, you're wrong. They're rather old. They have a radio receiver in here. They, have, they put veins on the control surfaces here, and they could actually change the pitch and make the bomb go right or left as it drops. They would have, it's not on this one, but they would attach a flare to it so the bombardier could actually track it as it's flying, or, being, or descending, I should say, moving around. They used it on, with the B-24s, Somewhat in the Pacific, but they had the best success in the Mediterranean. Here are the fan blades. These are actually wooden blades, but they've been painted silver. And you can see the first row, and you can barely make out the second row behind them. Now, between 48 and 50, they did a major rebuild. This was a, actually the, t uh, the tunnel they first put the uh, slot of wind, wind, uh, test section in to try it out, see if it would work. At the same time, they re-engined, uh, they put in larger uh, horsepower engines, and, and they changed the location of them as well. They're now back here, they were housed outside. Each one was 30,000 horsepowers. So if we went from 16,000 total to now 60,000 horsepower, it takes a lot of horsepower to move air if you want to increase it, you have to almost square the, 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 the amount of power you do. They, let's see. I want this thing for two reasons. First, they actually strengthened up the walls. The walls were built out of one to two inch steel. The original ones, they, they end up putting a different, a second ring in between the spacers that you saw earlier. And then they had the horizontal bars across it, strengthened up the, the structure even more. But I like this little note here, do not send to NASA headquarters. I'm not sure why, but that did catch my attention. This is the new uh, slotted uh, test section. It's eight-sided, eight and the slots are here. They, had a, they went from a one clam door to two to make it easier to get into, into it. Usually the first thing they'll test in one of these tunnels, when they do the initial testing or when they modify it, they want to test it, they'll do a body of revolution. It's a very simple thing to calculate. And they want to see if it flows well around it. 
it did. There's an aerial view. You can uh, clearly see the dimensions. Oh, and they also changed from the great big uh, seven bladed propellers to a lot shorter. Uh, 26, each uh, fan blade had 26 uh, spruce blades, which you'll see shortly. The original office building is here, and then they added on more. These are the spruce blades. That's one of the jobs we had in the model shop. We would have to go in and inspect the leading edges and all the surfaces, make sure there weren't any dinks, tears, or any other damages to the blades. If, if they were minor, we would replace repair them in, in, in sight. If they were major or somewhat major, we would have to remove them. Of course, they didn't like that because then that would actually shut the tunnel down. Mm. So this, you see the first set of blades and you can just barely see a second set of blades behind the first all the way around. <coughs> then, 1961, they wanted to increase it. With all the increase in the horsepower and everything, they finally were able, able to get up to Mach 1. But in 61, they wanted to get it even faster. So what they did, this is a little trick, is they put a compressor right here. It was a 35,000 horsepower compressor. And it would pull out 4.5% yeah, of the air from the test chamber. So you got it necking down, and that's going to increase the velocity. But now you're putting the suction right here, pulling out here. That increases the velocity of the air even more. And they finally, we got the, uh, the tunnel of hit Mach 1.3. This is a Hawker uh, P1127. If it looks vaguely familiar, that's because the Harrier aircraft is based on this airplane. It's being tested in 1960. They're also test uh, space capsules in here. This is the Apollo capsule. What they were doing is they would run, they wanted to find out how much flame and pigment would happen on the, the body if the, if the abort rocket fired. So they actually had, they had a little line come up here and run hydrogen peroxide again out. And you can see where it's striking it right here and another over here. This is B-1 bomber in 74. Uh, actually went ahead and painted the inside of the tunnel and made it look nice and bright. Here's the space shuttle. This is a full stack. A full stack is basically the shuttle itself, the fuel tank where you have the nitrogen and oxygen, and the solid uh, rocket boosters on the side. These wood parts represent the plume from the solid boosters and from the shuttle main engines. And it was deactivated in 2007 and demolished in that year of 2011. And that's another version of it going. Okay, we have, when they built these two 7 by 10 tunnels, they built them side by side. This is the low speed, which we'll talk about next. And this is the high speed and substations. Lots of substations. Big office complex. They actually had a common area where they would work on the models and either put them into test sections over here or over here. This one's a cooling tower. They did a little different on the high speed. They divided the, the functions, but we'll get to that shortly. Oh, well, I should have mentioned it with the 16 foot, but uh, in 1951, another Collier Trophy was given to John Stack. He was the head of the branch, of the branch head, but he got it for the, everybody who was working on it for the concept development application of the slide of walls and transonic wind tunnel test sections. Okay. The purpose of this 7 by 10 tunnel 
was to reduce the backlog work in the Langley's original uh, 7x10 tunnel. It was built in 1930, caused by World War II. Um, this was the only tunnel I could not get a, a price on. But if I had a hazard guess, I would say it was probably at least in the $1.5 million range. It was authorized in 42 and came online in February of 45. It was one fan blade. This is the main heat exchanger. This 17-foot test section came in at 55, 56. So we'll talk about that shortly. And it had a 7 by 10. It was basically a 15-foot long test section here. Even at 300 miles an hour, they, by then they ended up developing an uh, internal balance system. This is one example of it. Balance is inside here. It's set on the sting. So you know, no longer have mechanisms going down here, going into uh, the scales. This could, you know, the, uh, this thing could drop down to 10 or 20 degrees. So you can actually model it a little up for your uh, high angle attacks. Okay. This is, uh, I took this out of uh, just a in-house uh, brochure talking about 7 by 10 uh, in the uh, proper uh, publications. This would never have gotten in, but I thought it was cute. It just said, balance room, Christmas skeleton crew. <laughs> Okay, this is a settling chamber that I pointed out earlier. It's uh, basically 17 feet by 17 feet. It was used by, by 55, 56. There was a great demand for some place to test helicopters and VSOL aircraft. And they were able to put this in the upstream. The velocity was only 76 miles an hour, but that was fine for these uh, low speed model tests. You can actually see a wing with propeller on oh, here. Yeah. And the proper 7x10 test section is up here, a little further downstream. Now, this is a Bell L39. It's actually a, a P63 fuselage. But it has swept wings, yes, because it was testing swept wings at low speeds. Um, the Navy and the Air Force had split on when they were deciding how to do a research airplane. The Air Force went with rockets and they called that the X-1. The Navy wanted to do a little slower approach. They wanted to test with uh, jet engines and they were, they were interested in straight wings, but also swept wings. So they got Douglas to build their research aircraft. And they wanted to be able to test a swept wing because a few planes that, at the time that had swept wings, but they noticed when they were landing, they would get in a, what was called a Dutch roll would happen. The wing would start oscillating back and forth when you're landing, which is rather disconcerting for a pilot. Uh, especially, this was a, a had a landing gear up in the nose and in the tail. So the main first thing that was going to happen when you're oscillating like that, you couldn't then dampen it, dampen it down. One of these struts got hit first and could very well damage it. But they didn't want this to happen on the, on the research airplane, so they built this airplane to study that. As a side effect, they could also go up to about 350 miles an hour in a regular flight. So it was a very useful aircraft. What they're doing here is coming in at the landing at a high angle of attack, and the screen is called a turbulent screen. This is a case where they actually want turbulence, uh, rather than trying to get rid of it. This is a model of an X2, which was the second generation. The funny thing is, they actually started the program before the X1 even flew. This would have a top speed of Mach 3. But it didn't, really matter, it didn't matter much whether how fast an airplane goes, it always has to land. So 
So all this always has to slow down to make that landing. So you have to study it at those speeds too. Here you have a paraglider, inflatable paraglider. And this is a Gemini capsule. One idea that NASA was having at the time was rather than the method they used in Mercury where you just parachute down and hit the ocean, they were thinking that if they could get this, thing, this method to work, they could land it on a runway like Edwards or Kennedy. But what happened was, I mean, it tested fine in, in the tunnels because this was already inflated. But when they actually tried full-scale inflatable uh, paraglider with the dummy Gemini capsule, they did not have a great success rate on getting this inflatable <coughs> paraglider to unfold correctly every time. And if this is going to be man-rated, it had to work every time. So they ended up dropping the idea. Here, you have a B-52 model and you have an X-15 model. And this is just a still, because they would actually take movies of this. They let it go from, let it drop from the pylon and drop down. Going at 300 miles an hour, this would be close to launch velocity that the X-15 would see in real time. And they just wanted to see how it would fall. They, did, or they wanted it to fall straight, and it does but they had it tested in a tunnel first to make sure. Okay. I, I don't want to start the, uh, the next tunnel. Well, let's take a break early. Thank you all for coming back. I hardly even needed to ring the bell because everybody was in here. So we will turn it back over to Ben. Take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. 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 <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Have to wait for the battery to go green. Okay, so now we're going to go, whoops, and talk about the high speed tunnel over here. The difference between the two is, uh, well, seven by 10, 300 mile an hour tunnel. You know its velocity. The uh, high speed was designed to go about 675 miles an hour initially. Now, basically, it's very similar in some aspects. It just did have acoustic curtains here to keep down the noise. You had the fan blades here. You had a containment sphere basically for the pressure differentials because it necked down quite a bit. For the heat exchanger, it was a little different with this one. I'm not sure why. They put an air intake here and they had a separate exhaust system over here. It, it worked the same as the other one, but they just did it a bit different. The purpose of this tunnel was to investigate general aerodynamic effects at high speed, especially stability and control problems into and through Mach 1. The cost of this uh, wind tunnel was just a little over $2 million. If you notice, there's going to be a sharp rise in cost of wind tunnels. Um, it was authorized in 1943 and became operational in, in November of 1945. Uh, it was 242 feet long, about 75 feet wide, and it varied depending on which tower you're looking at, between 54 and 60 feet tall. It used a 14,000 horsepower electric motor to get that uh, 675 miles an hour. To, they weren't happy with that. They really wanted to go through Mach 1. So in the next year, in 46, they came up with a little makeshift method of doing that, which is basically a bump. And what that does is air flowing over here will actually speed up. So you will get Mach 1 here. This is the original one. It's rather short. They lengthened it. They got a little bit of turbulence because it sped, sped up too fast. So it's stretched out, better finesse ratio. And it got a, uh, it's still to Mach 1. 
This is kind of a, a playoff of what they were doing with actual uh, research aircraft. They were taking P-51s, mounting wings and fuselages, basically over where they had the machine guns, because they took those out, they put balances in there, and they just created a slightly a little bump over the airfoil in that section. And flying at uh, 450 miles an hour, they could basically, or going to a very shallow dive, they would easily exceed Mach 1 over the wing. And between cameras taking pictures uh, of, the, of the wing and the internal balance and instrumentation, getting the, the data that way, they were getting good, uh, they were getting information that they couldn't do at the time because the tunnels were being stalled out with all the transonic uh, shock waves and everything. This was before they found out about the slotted walls, so they were doing anything they could to, to get the speed they needed to get the data. Now, this is the same picture because it's basically the same tunnel as the other one, except it doesn't have a skeleton crew in there. Now, in 1955, they wanted to uh, see if they could get even more velocity, and they liked the idea of using those compressors on the 16-foot. So what they ended up doing was built a compressor here, and it would pump out a certain amount of the air in the test section and exhaust it up here out, and that sped it up. So they were able to... Uh, get 1.2 Mach. And they also, at the same time, put in a slot, a wind, uh, wind tunnel section. So with that greater speed, they were able also to get good data. This is the, uh, the fan blade section. We've got 18 blade with spruce grill blades and a hub. But this answers the age-old question. How many te uh, engineering technicians can you put on a hub, a fan blade hub? And the answer to that is 13. <laughs> now, apparently sometimes aeronautical engineers must have nightmares. Because this is a very strange looking model. Uh, oops. Uh, the wing is kind of curved this way, and this one kind of curves the other way. And the whole front end uh, is going up. You have really sharp vertical tails, six engine. It was supposed to be some type of transport, high speed. Uh, it, <laughs> like I said, it must have been some engineer's nightmare. But he got an a research authorization. The model was made and they tested it. And here we're, we're doing drop ball testing, but in a little different way than they did with the X-15 that you saw in the 7 by 10 low speed. Again, a model of the B-52, and this is a model you can barely make out, but it's the M2F2, it's a lifting body, and this was tested in the mid-60s, and actually flown in the latter part of the 60s and early 70s. What they wanted to do was find out what kind of interference or pressure differential they're getting between the pylon and the, and the airplane. This, is not, this, this was unpowered. It was just a lifting body would drop and basically fly it back to Earth. So, how it behaved off the uh, airplane was very important. They were just lower at, incre at increments and read the data until they finally got an understanding for the whole thing. Now this is a Piper civilian aircraft. What's interesting here is this technician here. He's, he's using what's called an inclinometer. It basically reads angles. So he's taking a reading on this particular wing here. What they'll have to do then is go on the other side and read the angle there. Now that establishes one or two things. Either it establishes that the wing is level, or it's not, depending on what they want. If they had to make changes, they'd go back and change things with the sting, how the sting is attached back in here and change the angle. This is a 74 supersonic transport. Well, by then, uh, Congress had killed it, basically, but the manufacturers had built wind tunnel models, and they had the tunnel time, so they put them in anyway, and they, they gathered data, which they might be able to use in the future. 
This is a uh, HL twenty C model. Basically, have a pattern of that down here on the table. Uh, but we'll see that. It's being tested. This is one, and I, I actually made a pattern on this, and we took it over to Foundry, and they cast this little sh shape to test it themselves. Well, it was deactivated. This one told was deactivated in, in, 90, in 94, and it was demolished in 09, a little ahead of everybody else. Now we're going to get into 14 by 22 subsonic tunnel. The purpose of this tunnel is low speed testing of powered and unpowered models of various fixed and rotary wing civil and military aircraft. It cost $5.6 million and was built in, uh, well, it was authorized in 65 and was and came, became operational in 70. And it was a long tunnel. It was 355 feet long, 135 feet wide, and height varied between 65 and 85 feet. Uh, a lot of times when they, if you look at the drawings in some of these tunnels, what they're doing is they're, they want to, what's the average distance of the, of the flow? And that's why you'll see these distances. But that's not the actual width nor is it the actual length. Uh, this has honeycomb here, it's fine screens here to help smooth out the airflow. It contracts down here. Let's see, what else we talk about? The fan blades here and the exhaust tower here. They built it right next to the seven by, seven by 10 low speed. Here's a 7x10 low speed, looking a little ratty. Uh, but they're building the new one right here. And this is Armstead Avenue, which I used to travel all the time going back from home and uh, watch it being built. Here it is, almost totally completed. It's quite longer than you 7x10, and you can just barely make out the 7 by 10 right here. Once this was completed, they basically tore this tunnel down and they <coughs> connected it to the 7 by 10 at high speed. In the shop area. Now, I'm basically going to talk about this. <laughs> Why is it 4 by 7 <coughs> meters? some point in the early 80s, uh, headquarters it came down with an announcement that all the tunnels, all the facilities, all the centers would change over to metric designations. So, okay, so the powers that be at Langley said, fine, we'll do it. But they did it in a very clever way. All the, all the buildings at Langley, whether it was the east side or west side, have a nameplate, basically a sign in front of the building. And it's usually made out of uh, three inch square aluminum and comes up and forms a rectangle and the bottom piece, piece in here. And, the foundry would basically cast the center section would have the names and letters and things like that in it. So, what did they do? They ended up cutting, uh, shearing out some aluminum that would cover over that sign, and they just basically painted the name on it and screwed it in. Well, probably about a year, a year and a half later, another announcement comes down from NASA headquarters. They said, we can go back to the English system. <laughs> so. They were able to unscrew these things and they were ready to go. Uh, we, they didn't uh, spend the money of making a whole new signs or anything. Now, I don't know what Ames or Lewis did, but uh, somebody was actually thinking for a change. That's, it's like I said, it's a long tunnel. And basically, it's just off uh, picture. Had to have a fisheye for this to get it all in. Now, this is 93, mind you, and here, this is Boeing, whoops, this is Boeing, and they built the model. You gotta get another one of these things. Uh, 
Even though the uh, high-speed civil transport was killed, dead, buried, staked through its heart, everything, in 72, uh, they dug this thing and wanted to test it. And they paid for it, so we tested it. Now, in 94, they knew that shortly they would be having to close down the uh, full-scale tunnel. And when they would do that, they would lose certain, lose certain capabilities, one of which would be a free flight of models inside the tunnel. So they actually, they tried and they did fly. This was the first one. This is an older model, but they went ahead and they figured they'd go ahead and give it a try. It's like a full-scale tunnel. It had a long, big cable that had exhaust gas that come out through here. At least this had one advantage over the uh, full-scale tunnel. It could go 230 miles an hour at the max. So that was a lot more air thrust for lift. It also had the control lines going in here that would operate the control surfaces, and it had a safety cable. But, as I want to point out, everything is pretty open here. If anything went wrong, you don't have a lot of room like you do in a, a full-scale tunnel. As far as I know, they've never had a have had an accident yet. Now, this is a helicopter being tested. Well, actually, it's a generic helicopter. What they're really testing is the rotary system up here in the blades. So this is a generic body. And this is what's called a double bubble, twin tube wide fuselage. There was, even before the 707, a favorite a fuselage shape for tra uh, aircraft commercial transports was basically a circle. It was very easy to pressurize. Basically, this is two circles joined together a little bit in the middle, giving you a flat top and a flat bottom. This would allow a longer, thinner wind, wing. And being flat like this, when the airflow goes over at a certain point, it's going to become turbulent. But now we have the engines mounted in the back. And those engines would just pull that turbulence right out, straighten it out, and actually reduce drag from that. Twin tail, detail top. And even though this picture was done in 2014, about a month and a half ago, I was reading the Aviation Week in Space Technology in the library here, and they had a picture of this, the same picture basically in the tunnel. And they're talking about a future transport whether or not it happens, we'll never know because one of the companies, whether it's going to be Boeing or Airbus, is going to have to uh, go against convention and build, have the nerve to build it. But we'll see. Another strange shape they're working on is a blended wing body, where you don't have a round body, you basically have the fuselage smushed a little bit and stretched out sideways and blends right into the wing. There's no discernible bottom or even top. And that, you know, commercial airliner would have a circular wing and the, the wings would be mid, mid or lower wing mounted. But here it's not that way. Mm -hmm. This was in 15. We built a lot of models in the West. I know I got out of, I retired in 04. And it seemed like a good five or six years before that we were building a lot of blended wing models. And they're still playing with them. Now here's another blended wing model, but this is interesting because now there's a new way of testing, getting data. They're actually using a laser that's going across the upper part of the body. And these, this laser can actually track individual particles as it goes over and actually make a movie. And with today, too, with all the computational power they have, they can make live movies. You can actually see it, slow it down, see how the particles react. They can do anything they want with the data, almost real time. And now we're coming to the uh, last tunnel. So you can hold your applause. Uh, this one's going to be the National Transonic Tunnel. I've got a lot of time in this tunnel. It's, it's the NTF, basically that's what we call it. It's uh, 230 feet long and 70 feet wide. It's got a 15 to 1 contraction ratio. It really can speed up things up. 
This whole thing here is basically a containment area, but it's built circular, so you really don't see it. Uh, it's slotted. Uh, it's got six slots on the, front, on the ceiling and six on the bottom floor. And see, we have turn vein one, turn vein two, turn vein three, and turn vein four. And that will become obvious in a short while. Fan blades are right here. Let's go. Now, what makes this tunnel interesting, or unique actually, is it's cryogenic. They pump in uh, liquid out nitrogen. It goes through a, a, a spray system. Basically, they're looking to get nas gaseous nitrogen. So bring the temperature of the tunnel down to about minus 300 to minus 320 degrees. And if we remember our friend Reynolds, the three items on the top of this equation was size, velocity, and density. And if you cool air, in this case nitrogen, you're going to increase the pressure, you're going to increase the density. That makes it better for better rental numbers for testing. But how are you going to get to the model if you want to make changes to it? So we devised a system, seven by foot, basically square two, a rectangle that they could push in on one side. They have a seal that would go around this thing here, and the same thing would happen on the other side. So basically, you would let this model warm up so it's no longer cryogenic because it's very hard to handle. It's cold. And then the technicians could go in there and change whatever uh, control surfaces they needed to and then get out and they would pull these out and they'd be able to do the test again. Being cryogenic meant all the models had to be aluminum or stainless or a particular type of aluminum, a particular type of stainless. stainless. It had to be uh, certified to be cryogenic approved because one of the things you don't want is for it to become super brittle at that low temperature, at which any slight problems could make a chunk of it go off and cause problems. Now, even though we're on the west side and a mile or so away, everything has to go in with pilings, as I mentioned. Oops. He's driving the pilings. And when this is going on, all you hear is thud, thud, thud all day long. And then when they got the <coughs> pipes down to bedrock, they would come in and fill them with concrete, all to assure that you have a stable platform for that tunnel that doesn't move. Parts, a lot of the parts were made off-site. Uh, the tunnel was made out of stainless steel, and it was a lot of the parts were shipped in on this super guppy airplane. That particular part is right here. This is the test section. That's part of the mechanisms that go in and out. Your uh, fan blades are going to be back in this area. A little further in time, they actually end up getting it painted white now. These are going to be used for the vent system, these holes right here. They're building a big, they can call it a containment area, although it's not really holding any pressure. But they had office, offices and things like that inside here, too. Now, when they were, this tunnel could also run in the ambient air. So if, when it did run on ambient air, they'd have to get rid of the nitrogen. And this is one of the vent tubes. The other one's over here, goes down, comes up here. Uh, there's a highway here that goes this way. And when I got off in the afternoon, it wasn't unusual. If this thing was running and there was, it was venting, you would just see this great big screaming column of white going up. And the one thing we Hampton area has is an abundance of humidity. So if you have humidity and cryogenic tem temperature, what do you get? Snow. snow. Yeah. So it just depend on which way the wind was blowing. I might get some snow going this way, and I might not. It would make for an interesting trip home. This is the fan blades we were using. We were not using metal. We were not using wood. We were using fiberglass. And not just any old fiberglass. It had to be certified cryogenic. Not only cryogenic, down to about 320, but it also had to be able to be operated up to about 150 or above degrees 
because it was operating the air mode, ambient air mode, you would have a cooling uh, screen that would pump in cool air, water, and that screen would stay cold and would cool down the temperature, again, to keep it to about 150. But uh, initially, they grabbed about eight to 10 people from our shop, sent them over to the east side to the old east model shop, which had been vacated. They threw in an autoclave over there. And those guys basically developed the procedures, the manuals on how to build a cryogenic fiberglass blade, which hadn't been done before. Um, this was all in the hopes that a contractor would come along and be able to build the blades. Well, in November of 75, when they got the initial authorization to build this, they said it was going to cost $65 million to build. I say, okay. So headquarters gave it to them. By 77, they were behind schedule, and they were finding out that the bids to build uh, these blades was much, much higher than they anticipated. Uh, the bids to put insulation inside the tunnel, it's a cryogenic tunnel, you don't want to waste all that coldness going out into the Hampton atmosphere, so they would put the insulation on the inside. The bids for that was extremely high. Um, and by 77, they had raised the, they had gone back to his quarters and, and pleaded poverty or whatever, and they, they were able to get another 20, 20 million. So it came up to $85 million to build. But ultimately, they did. We ended up making the blades ourselves, and we ended up making the insulation. So the cost is actually higher than what's claimed. Now this is inside the tunnel. Oops. And what you see are a bunch of columns, short, short rods, and these rods would basically hold these T-sections. These are fiberglass T-sections. And the T-sections would hold these fiberglass panels. The panels were actually broken in two pieces, so it could be fit in. There's a key to lock it in here, and another one up here. They would be covered. Everything had to be new for this thing. The adhesives, as we would use here and elsewhere, was called a crest. It had to be specially developed to stand temperatures between uh, 320 minus to 150 degrees or plus. And it was, it was peculiar. It came in basically at room temperature in solid form. They had to throw it in an oven to 200 degrees to get it to liquid. Then they had it mixed together because it was epoxy. And then, depending on what was winter or summer, when they get, came in the tunnel and gave it to us, we would have maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour to work with it before <coughs> it began to solidify on us. Fun stuff to play with. And also it was weird. It had an odor almost like grape. Strange stuff, and black too. Now once they uh, got all the T-rails in, and all the foam, they came up, put an aluminum plate in here between all the rails. Actually, they put another top on top of it, I should say. These are the injectors, which you're seeing here, where the liquid nitrogen come in and turn into a gas and cool the tunnel down. Now, and that's me too, if you don't recognize it. <laughs> they took about another uh, 20, 25 people out of the model shop, and we got to ins uh, put insulation between the turning veins in all four of those veins. This is turn vein four, that was my vein, so to speak. But every vein had probably about five to eight people, depending on the complexity of it. These things were probably on the order of, well, they varied because in the center they were wider than they were at the ends. Generally speaking, they're about four to three feet wide. But you basically had a compound curve. You had it going up this way, and the bottom was going like this way on the other side. So everything had to be hand fitted. We would work with the uh, five pound foam, come into strips, and hand fit each one to the bottom 
because it had to be flushed to the bottom. They didn't want any air gas. Then we would call in, and once we got, probably, this is just before I would glue them in, I would take them all out again, and then we would put the crest down on the floor, and then put them back in, putting crest between each one. And then once this whole thing was taken care of, I'd come back and coat the whole thing with crest and put a layer of fiberglass on. And this gives you a rough idea of the size. I mean, you've got the tunnel walls around here and down at the bottom. You could work from the bottom up to about here, and after that you needed scaffolding. We got plenty of it. And we basically called ourselves the second floor gang. <laughs> and there I am. And, uh, the thrills never ended because when you got up the top, then you had to work against gravity. Trying to get all that stuff in. You used a lot, a lot of nails to, to hold that stuff together and wood boards. It wasn't the nicest job in the world, but we got it done. Now this is a pre-pathfinder model of the self-adjusting sting assembly. Everybody has fun in the tunnel. And this fellow is actually named Don Smith, but he's not your Don Smith. <laughs> It's the one we know. Blindly. And when you know, as luck would have it, six years later, a contractor had a model in the tunnel, and the metal part came off. It went down, and it tore up every blade, just delaminated. Everything was lost. That's 35 blades. It had to be made. Now, Somebody had the foresight that after we had made the original set of 35 blades, they went into a slow production mode. So over those six years, they actually had made another 15 blades. So in essence, we only had to make another 20. But they wanted it done fast. So again, they grabbed a bunch of Few, a few machinists, a few fan people, but again, the majority of the people they took out were uh, model shop people. This is a close-up of the, the blade. This is for final inspection. Um, it's basically composed of about a, 143 different parts. Now, some of the parts are big, like this piece here, foam, and this piece here, and these. But most of it, well, you have a center core that you had, we had to make first. We had, a, we had a shape, a piece of foam, five pound foam, I believe, or maybe it was 15 pound foam. Then layer of wrap around a certain number of layers of glass, put it in a rubber bag, throw it in the autoclave, where we would pull a vacuum on it, put pressure on it, put heat and cure it, come back out, check it, verify it, and just keep doing that until you build up, basically build up a shape. You have a leading edge, a trailing edge piece that was done like that too. So here's George Blank, he's in the autoclave, checking on the vacuum fitting. And these blades all went everywhere on these stands. And I think by its, everything had to be verified, everything had to be checked, and everything had to be signed off every step of the way. And when I left, we must have had, well, they had the original 35 blades. Each one had a 3 mm binder, and they were all about an inch thick. And they had the ones we were working on. And the same thing, it's like a little library in one of the offices. So if anything ever happened, they could go back and see what, what the problem was. Now, here is the, uh, the C-17 being tested in the uh, NTF, 93. Another full-scale stack, but this one's all metal. By this time, what they were testing is they were running problems with the foam going off the, the nose area here and going back. So they had to re reconfigure and redesign some of the feed lines, which required testing and verification of the tunnel. This is the 777 being tested. And what's a little unique, what you need, what is unique about this is this thing is not a, a vertical table normally be. So that way they could get data underneath the bottom of the flow. 
And we've seen the Navy subs before, but this is a this is a newer one. It's inverted. The sail, I mean, the tower is here. You got the sails here. This has to be done. This is not metal. This has to be done in the, in the, the ambient air mode. But I couldn't find anything about if this was a particular type of sub, sub design or what. They were mum about that. And this is the last picture that I have on the uh, NTS. This is the original tank to hold the nitrogen. But the man was the, the man was so great they ended up building another one. We had a private contractor build off site uh, liquid liquefaction site that would make the liquid nitrogen for us. It would be piped over the road, then down and over here, put into the tank. But at some point, I guess, they thought it would be better. They ended up building, they broke ground in 2008 to build this plant, liquefaction plant here. And this is one of the towers. Um, it was going to be manned, from what the article said, by NASA personnel to be run by them. So I guess maybe that was more economical now. And that is basically the wind tunnels. Now, we have basically what, about 10 minutes. Okay, I'm open for questions. And I also have a bunch of uh, different patterns and models here I could talk about. So, whichever way you want to go. George. And uh, you worked in the model shop. Right. And how on earth do you make a model that will react the same way that a full-scale plane would react? I mean, it seems to me it's kind of intuitive to do that. No, you got everything had to be exactly the same. Okay. How can you make a scale model that would react the same way a real aircraft? The same the aircraft thing. Because you have to make it exactly external dimensions to three places. Now, when uh, everybody's familiar with at least two me measuring systems, you have the metric system, you have the English system. There's a hybrid. The metric is in tens, English is not. It's in inches, foot, and feet, and yards. But you can convert English into an engineering scale, basically, I think that's what it's called, where you take an inch and divide it into tens. So, using that system is what a lot of engineering people use worldwide, or at least in the United States. So half an inch would be 0 0.500, quarter of an inch would be 0 0.250, eighth of an inch would be 0.125. And when I'm saying we put things to three places, I mean that. Um, an example of thickness or of dimensions, if you look at your register, the paper on the register, that is uh, 0 0.0025, two and a half thousandths. So, when we get our dimensions, when we get our paperwork from our engineering department, they would give it to us, everything in three places. And you would have to build your pattern to be exactly that size. And from that pattern, you would lay fiberglass on top of that, make a mold, pop the two apart, and now you can lay fiberglass inside that. And all, that you're doing, all your dimensions should stay the same. And when you're finished, you would have a scale model that's equivalent to to the real thing. How about weight, though? Yeah. Well, weight? weight only comes in on certain air. Uh, what? Do, how about weight? Weight only comes in on certain airplanes, <coughs> on certain tunnels. Spin models have to be by weight because. Well, that's one of the criteria. That's the extra criteria. And what you do there is they want the weight for the empty aircraft. No gas, nothing. And when you get a, you get a job, you find out the empty weight. You find out the scale that model's going to be. I've got a, a Piper team model pattern up here. Um, and that was 1 13th scale. You cube the scale, divide it into the empty weight, and that will tell you how much weight you have to build that model. I had one pound, 16 ounces, to build that 
everything. All the bulkheads, spars, skins, everything. So you adjust your uh, building techniques accordingly. Uh, some models didn't matter at all. Uh, we had some models that you take up into a helicopter and drop them. They were not tested in the tunnel. These are called drop models. We had no weight limits on that other than what the helicopter could lift. So basically you're talking about something of the order five to 600 pounds that we'd go with. And we basically built those rather thick, almost between eighth to a quarter inch thick walls. We used aluminum bulkheads because when this thing dropped, it would usually let it go around 15,000 feet. It would go into a dive. It had a television in the nose of a canopy, and the pilot would be on the ground, and he would actually fly, remote control of that airplane. He would put it into a dive, pick up speed, then go through the maneuvers that were required for that test. When it got down to about 5,000 to 2,000 feet, they would pop a parachute and let it fall down, or parachute down into the water they would recover. Um, other models, the only weight limit would be basically what the sting could take, the balance system. The engineering department would basically come back to us and say, all right, this one is going to 7 by 10 at the time. And we might have, you don't want the model any more than 250 pounds, which was usually more, I mean, we usually would come in under, under that. Models in the tunnels were basically interested in exterior dy dynamics, the shape, uh, how the flaps worked, things like that. The wing, we made, you know, sweat wing models, things like that. Uh, we made uh, like models for 737 where we deployed the flat Fowler flaps. I don't know if you ever looked on a uh, 737 one. If you're sitting next to a wing and you watch the, 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 the landing flaps deploy, it's actually like three levels of them. They, they compress, but they, they come out on tracks when they land. So we have, we have to make those things. Whatever is required, we make. Thank you. Anybody? <clears throat> uh, does turbulence scale? Mm, I don't think so. Does turbulence scale? I don't think so. Turbulence is just a problem. It doesn't scale at all. So, have a small model, let's say a 120th model, uh, how can that represent the turbulence that you would actually see on a, the actual thing that would be 20 times larger? Okay, I'm, I'm thinking one type of turbulence, you're thinking of something else. I was thinking of turbulence inside the wind tunnel. That's, that is not scalable. That's, you're not going to see that in real flight. Okay. I think that would, but you're change, you would change the drag and wouldn't be scaled at the small one, but I don't know. You want to know about on a real airplane or model, how do you correlate the drag or the turbulence, which is drag, to the real one? <laughs> I can't give you the answer right now. <laughs> Sorry. I'll think about it now. I now maybe have something for you next week. Anybody else? Ben, can you explain uh, transonic, that term? That's the area between subsonic and, and supersonic. It's the area generally considered 0.8 to 1.2, that, that span in there, where uh, when, air, when an airfoil flies through the air, at a low speed, it has no problem. But the faster it goes, the air can't get out of the way quick enough. And you start building a wall, so to speak, or a shock wave in front of it. And this is the beginning of transonic. It eventually gets to a point where it hits the leading edge and it actually travels up on the top and lower wings back. But the area right behind that shock wave is going to have a turbulent flow. And then if it gets back to the area on the wing where you have control surfaces, that's if um, you ever watched um, The Right Stuff or some other movies, they'll show planes that are going to the assigned area and, and it's a lot of turbulence and everything's jumping up and down. That's because this turbulent area behind the shockwave or the shockwave itself is not a single 
perfect little shock wave. It varies in intensity, and that intensity varying makes the turbulence, so it just generates an up and down motion on the airplane. If it hits the control surface, the pilot is basically helpless. He can't do a lot. So we want to min minimize that uh, shock wave. And Richard Wick Wickham, which we mentioned before, he developed in the 70s what's called a supercritical wing. That's a wing that's a little flatter on the top than it is on the bottom. And that actually delays and reduces the shock wave when you get up to transonic. It was made. Uh, it was developed back, this was the early 70s when you were having high prices of gases and everything like that. They wanted to develop an airfoil that would fly at high speeds but uh, save money. You know, because if it flowed through the air quicker, uh, nicer, cleaner, you'd get better gas mileage that way. Extend your range. Hope that answered it. Okay. And we want to thank you very much for sharing with us things we didn't know. I mean, I did, speaking for myself, that I didn't even know anything about. So thank you very much. I want to tell. Yes. I want to tell you about the lab, the next two Wednesdays next week. Um, Sig Barber will be talking to us about Ansel Adams, and that will be our last official class. But the following week, on the 16th, there will be a discussion group with Dr. J.R. Paulson based upon questions and things that came up from his course. So if you're interested in that, um, plan to come on the 16th. And after next week's class, we'll have a handout for those of you who are interested that will list some of the things that will be talked about that, night, that day. So remember to turn off your T-coils and get your cell phones out charged up again, and we'll see you next week. Thank you all for coming. Okay, one thing I want to mention, I want to thank uh, Bob, Jim, Jack, <coughs> Julianne, Judy, and all the other members of the uh, Bucket Course staff for helping me. They do a lot of work behind the scenes that you just aren't aware of, and I think they deserve a big hand too.